everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. We are 100% sponsor based, which means that all the revenues we derive come from sponsorships. But I try to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically trying to choose those who have values well aligned to the values expressed on the show, like freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do is a few ad reads right here at the top of the show and then a few ad, ad reads in the middle. And I hope you won't skip them. I hope you'll take the time, listen and see what they have to offer, because again, these are hand selected sponsors. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Pacific Bitcoin Conference, brought to you by SWAN. Now this is going to be a two-day event in Los Angeles, November 10th and 11th, 2022. And if you haven't been to a Bitcoin conference yet, I highly recommend it, as there really is no better way to get integrated into the Bitcoin community. Speakers announced so far include Michael Saylor, Lynn Alden, uh, many others. I'll be speaking as well. Uh, Michael Saylor is even quoted as saying, this is going to be the event of the year, so you definitely don't want to miss it. Uh, so go to PacificBitcoin.com and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get your tickets today. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized U.S. dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Corey Clipson, welcome back to the What Is Money Show. What's up, Rob? Good to be here. It's round three for us, I believe. Yeah, round three recording, round 900 of chatting. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've got this big Pacific Bitcoin conference right around the corner. Uh, yeah, two weeks out from uh, from this recording date. It's crazy. Yeah, we're recording here on October 27th. I think we'll get this episode out pretty quick. And man, where has the year gone? Just months keep going faster and faster. But this event, I'm excited because the Bitcoin conference has been awesome every year, but it's gotten quite large. Uh, so I'm excited to do something on the West Coast, a little bit more of a chill vibe, and hopefully a little bit more intimate. Uh, it, it'll have the intimacy. I can't promise chill. You'll be able to chill, but there's going to be plenty of excitement. We are uh, definitely pulling out of the stops. It's it's pretty easy to put on a very entertaining conference in the world's capital for entertainment. There's a lot of things that you can kind of bring to the table, uh, and production companies and talent that is uh, in the area that you can bring to make it a really fun, almost like a Bitcoin festival of sorts. Oh yeah. I like that Bitcoin festival. It kind of did that at the Bitcoin conference, right? They had that, what was it? Sound, sound money fest or something on the last. They day? did. Yeah. They did a, they did a concert. Uh, I think the day after maybe Saturday. I missed that whole thing though. So what, tell me yeah. like, what, what are the unique thing? I know we talked about this a little bit, but you told me, there's a couple of uh, special events and special programming that's going on. Yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, first of all, the conference takes place in an airplane hangar, which is pretty sweet <laughs> in the first place. So it's the uh, the Barker hangar at Santa Monica Airport. Uh, they've done tons of events there over the years. This is like uh, the, the every year spot for the MTV Movie Awards back in the glory days and stuff like that. So it's cool. It's a, it's a really fun venue. Uh, we also have, we're bringing back the Swan Dome which a lot of people remember from uh, the Bitcoin 2021 conference, the first year in Miami, we had the Swan Dome outside. So we made, made a bigger version of that. And so that's the second stage at this at the Pacific Bitcoin conference is the Swan Dome. And then we have a third stage called the Magic Money Court, which is an actual basketball court with bleachers. And uh, so there's going to be performances there and some talks, and then also the uh, the Bitcoin Classic three-on-three -three tournament and um, exhibitions by the Compton Magic, which is the top AAU basketball team in the, in the country, which is here in LA, obviously. 
a bunch of NBA players stopping by, um, the professor, the, one of the best ball handlers in the world, famous from, uh, from his 15 plus years with the and one tour, uh, is coming and, and hanging out and doing an exhibition and kind of like a fireside chat. So definitely sort of basketball entertainment flex inflected on that stage. And then of course, you know, inside it's, it's all the big hitters. It's Sailor and Lynn and, and Jeff Booth and you and Larry Lapard and Greg Foss and Natalie and Stefan and Brady and Jan and Corey and the whole Swan crew. Like, you know, so it's just going to be, it's going to be a ton of fun. A lot of big sponsors, cool looking booths, lots to learn. The, uh, the Swan Dome, uh, content is very more like insider Bitcoin tech focused. And then the, the hard money stage is, uh, is the main stage. And that one is, you know, kind of what you would normally expect from a main stage at a Bitcoin conference. But yeah, it looks like we'll be somewhere between 1200 and 1500 people. Um, and then, yeah, as you mentioned, a lot of side events, the VIP experience in particular at this conference is a big focus for us. So, uh, incredibly beautiful area to hang out for the for the vip folks um big vip party on thursday evening six hours full buyout of a beautiful restaurant bar on ocean avenue in santa monica um indoor outdoor gonna be an awesome experience and then there's a wrap party for the vips on saturday as well so we rented like a gorgeous cliffside you know 180 degree panoramic view of nothing but the ocean and the palisades um, you know, and so that sort of Bitcoin or brunch, uh, the day after to kind of celebrate what we have wrought, uh, should be a lot of fun. So it's a good one to consider ponying up for, I would say. Yeah. It sounds like a lot to do the, the, tell me about the Swan Dome, Bitcoin 2021. I don't, I think I popped in there once, but maybe like, what were you guys doing there that was unique? And then are you replicating that this time? Yeah. Out? Yeah. Well, we, we broadcast live the entire day, both days <laughs> at, at, at Bitcoin 2021. So we threw like a, a mini conference in the conference and it was all just Bitcoin, no crypto at all, obviously. And um, yeah, it just became kind of like the place that Bitcoiners wanted to hang out. And there were people just milling around inside and outside the dome till like 6 p.m. both days. Uh, long after the conference was over, the Bitcoiners just didn't want to leave because they were just kind of hanging out at the Swan Dome. Nice. Are you guys doing that again this year, doing the broadcasting from the dome? Uh, so, yeah. So the the Swan Dome will be streamed live. Um, so that, that stream will be on YouTube. We're not going to stream. We're actually going to stream the hard money stage live to our own website and then put it on YouTube with the clips because I didn't want to give up the uh, the magic of being able to play music that is copyrighted mm -hmm. as the intro music and the transition music. Um, so we'll put the clips up on YouTube from the main stage, but you'll be able to watch it live on the Swan website. Nice. Very cool. And the... So VIP, the, the Thursday night party is VIP only. VIP. There's a huge pleb party on Wednesday night. So the night before. Yeah. Um, and then there's an after party at the at the hangar uh on Friday evening. So as the conference closes, it goes straight into like a you know a, a party. So food, drink, DJ, the whole thing. Nice. And then did you disclose have you disclosed the location of the VIP party yet? Or is that kind of the day before thing? That's under wraps. Got it. Yeah. Um, this is reminding me too, you know, we used to talk about this, that you, what you used to throw parties like way back in the day. So this, are you kind of like, it's not, not that far back in the day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I always enjoyed uh, throwing parties and I had a philosophy of like, you know, basically like, putting in a lot of work to organize and put on events and never take a dime for it. And I've done that basically my whole adult life um, and never tried to make money off of it because it just is, it just has so many other benefits to your network mm -hmm. and to your life of just that currency of being able to be, you know, the person that brings people together. So yeah, we used to throw huge Halloween parties in Chicago, you know, 1400 people in a giant <laughs> West loop loft uh, met my wife at one of those and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've been organizing tech salon monthly. I ran for a, a decade across Chicago and LA, uh, you know, just like once a month getting people together. And I would always just like 
I think you've been to a few of those like pre COVID, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I would just always buy all the food and just kind of feed everybody and make everybody buy their own drinks. And that was always kind of like a nice balance. It was easy to get people out, but it didn't, didn't break the bank. It cost me a couple hundred bucks a month or something to keep this thing rolling. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's important to provide a platform for people to get together and to make connections. And I think it's important for Bitcoin to have that, you know, once a year on the West coast, I think it's really important that that happens in, in Los Angeles in particular here at the, again, the place where, where culture emanates from probably more for better or worse, more than any other single location, it's probably here. Yeah. And so, you know, we're dragging a lot of influencers and a lot of agents and a lot of Hollywood types, you know, to the conference mm -hmm. and exposing them to Bitcoin and exposing them to the power of Bitcoin and Bitcoiners and the ideas that that will be shared from the stage and inside conversations. And I think it's um, it's really important not to cede this territory. Yeah, no, absolutely. To take this territory for Bitcoin. Yeah, I agree. I was just reflecting like, you know, even just five, six, seven years ago, Bitcoin was much less accessible for people. Like it, this may sound disparaging, but Bitcoin has become more cool the past few years. And I think these types of efforts, right? Having these big events, um, people that can speak to Bitcoin maybe in a non-technical way, uh, really painting the picture for its, its broader implications on the world. Like all of that is doing... It's very important, I guess, for building the actual culture around it, rather than just trying to talk about the technical aspects of Bitcoin, which can put most people to sleep. So you got to you got to do both, you know, yeah. and and you mix it up, and you know, I, I think they're both kind of like if you think of the two stages, it's like maybe eighty percent accessible, twenty percent, you know more arcane or or deep on the main stage and then the swan dome will be the opposite it'll be like 80 percent more yeah. uh you know kind of insider people that are a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole and like 20 percent, you know more accessible kind of top of funnel so i think that fits really well to have two stages like that yeah i like that and then i agree with you on just creating these forums for social engagement um Lots of benefits, right? I mean, I have a, one of my best friends from college. He was the social chairman. We had two social chairmen in our fraternity. And that was basically what they were doing. They were throwing events, right? Yep. And um, that, he's now one of the <laughs> one of the youngest uh, executives at MGM. So he's, that's what he does for a living now. And and yeah, I've learned a lot just by, by being close to him and seeing how he thinks about all all the social engagement building. It's not something I've ever specialized in or, or done myself, but I've definitely seen seen the fruits of that labor. And um, it's great, man. It's great to bring people together, especially around really big ideas, important ideas like Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we saw it with um, earlier this month. So I don't know, 20 days ago or something we had you and James Lavish and Sailor and, you mm -hmm. know, all these folks come in for kind of like a, a mini conference for a few days mm -hmm. uh, before and after Sailor got the uh, the Atlas Gala uh, award or whatever on, um, what was that, the 7th of October or something. And, and just getting everybody together on Wednesday, even though it was only like 100 people, I mean, it was just amazing to get that group together and, and then to be able to hang out and you know kick it with kind of like a flowing day party on friday you know you, you can create these little mini experiences i mean we we did it years ago i remember when svetsky came into town and i went and picked him up from the airport and we all just like sure. met up at justa in venice and yeah. i mean that's kind of legendary that's when i like really bonded with you brecky svetsky and then you know if you think about the origins of this company that i run swan i mean this this dates back to uh, you know, June 26th and 27th of 2019 at the Bitcoin conference in, in SF, right. where I met, you know, Jan and Stefan at the exact same time in person uh -huh. for the first time ever. Right. And yeah. it's the only time I met a lot of these people <laughs> until, until two weeks from now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, um, the Swan Salon, that was the first one I had attended that Wednesday night, whatever that yep. was, beginning of October. 
that was a lot of fun too. Just good yep. energy, you know, just getting people into kind of a laid back, semi intimate social setting, got food, got drinks. And yep. so I was, is that the professor that was there too? The the guy the who professor was- did come. <laughs> yeah. So the, the professor is the the short white guy. And then yeah, John Sally was there as the tall black guy. Oh, John Sally. Okay. <laughs> yeah, from the from the Pistons. He lives here in LA, not too far away from my house. Gotcha. Nice. Um, but yeah, so we do Swan Salon monthly here in LA. So that's the first Wednesday of every month. And then starting in December, we're gonna be doing Swan Salon in Miami every month as well. Oh, cool. Once a month in Miami. The programming always similar to what we did uh, earlier this month. Like it's kind of, it depends. I mean, it can be a panel. It can be a one-on-one interview. Um, We usually shoot content and try to get content for, um, for hard money or for one of our other shows uh, at, at the event. Um, And so, yeah, I think the, the theory there is if we have an event the first Wednesday of every month in LA, the third Wednesday of every month in Miami, we should be able to get somebody pre- like a pretty big name to show up, you know, twice a month and mm-hmm. you can shoot, you can shoot them in studio or in a venue that we control like earlier in the day or the day after or something like that. And then they'll also come to the event and it's a big draw for, in particular, this is for Swan private clients. Right. It's uh, it's for the the high net worth division of Swan. So that the Swan Salon's invite only. So I was gonna ask it's that. invite only, yeah. location not disclosed, no tickets available. You can't yeah. buy a ticket. Yeah, that was a super cool spot too. Uh, what was it? A mansion we were in? What was that? Yeah, it was a it was a mansion that we rented uh, up Kings Road from uh, from the Sunset Strip. Yeah, yeah, great spot. Tough parking, but great spot. <laughs> you weren't supposed to park. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, that all did. Yeah, I'm excited. I've been like kind of just trying to prepare myself, my mind, my body for all this travel and and talking. You know, for me, I'm introverted naturally. So these, as much as I love these in-person experiences, it takes a lot out of me. Like it takes a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, it is so like to sit here and, you know, read, write, talk about Bitcoin kind of in this little chamber for months on end. And then you go out into the, you know, I guess, real world with real Bitcoiners in person. And there's just so much more connection. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of love, really. People are just, you know, I guess when people gather around common values, there's just this automatic camaraderie. Like even people that don't yeah. know, they just instantly hit it off, instantly can kind of skip all the small talk and get to uh, some real yeah. deep interpersonal relationship. And these events, these experiences cultivate all of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I should mention one other thing that we're doing, which is, um, so it's a private event the day before the conference on November 9th. And it's specifically for, it's actually targeted at generalist VCs. So that are, that are non-crypto VCs and not already into Bitcoin to come and meet the Bitcoin industry. So it's a lot of the speakers, a lot of the seed VCs and a lot of the founders. So that's probably about 50 people. And then we're working on getting a list of about 50 generalist VCs to come and like understand that Bitcoin is not this, this crypto pump and dump factory mm-hmm. and that it's actually distinct and that it has its own sources of funding. And, and to basically make the case, which I think is very clear that the venture capital industry is underinvested in the Bitcoin ecosystem by a factor of at least 10, probably 100. Mm-hmm. versus what it's put into, you know, the crypto pump and dumps. Yeah, that's a good good battle to be fighting too, because the crypto pump and dump thing really just seems to be massively attractive to traditional VCs, almost as a way to like, I don't want to say accelerate their existing business model, but um, it's a little bit different, I guess, a little bit more scammy and scummy. But, well, yeah, they just have that fast time to liquidity and they can they can get out of their investment before the company builds anything at all. Right. right. They have, it has no revenue and no purpose, no product market fit. And you can also you can get rich off of it if you market it well. Yeah. So if you claim claim the world will be fixed by this crypto blockchain thing, whatever is your flavor right. of the month, you know, you can get out of your investment before it collapses and make so a bunch of money. It's shrunk that traditional VC 
window of illiquidity from 10, seven to 10 years to seven yep. to 10 months, basically. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's important, man, because it, I am increasingly concerned about that, especially on the, the tail of our prior conversations, that there is just yeah. so much, such large incentives for big money to engage in those types of scams that not yeah. only detract, as you know, to your point, kind of suck capital out of that would otherwise go into Bitcoin into this, into these uh, poor investments, let's say. But then it's also being used, the, the proceeds that are that are fleeced off of people are then used to fund these, uh, fund false narratives, frankly, against Bitcoin, yep. you know, pro proof of stake or whatever, uh, whatever the yep. bulls are spending. Anti-Bitcoin mining. Yeah, yeah. ESG FUD, all of the above. So yeah, seems like- All those talking points, none of those talking points generate in- in DC circles, they all come from the crypto industry. Yeah, and then they go and they lobby and they whisper, and then you hear a politician talk about it afterward. Right, but it all comes from consensus and Ripple and Andreessen Horowitz. Yeah, so we need to be a counter force against that in a very serious way. Um, I, I guess we could do that real quick. Let's just since we talked last about yeah. really long, I think insightful, hopefully useful conversations about Bitcoin versus crypto. Uh, why, you know, we essentially consider crypto to be all scams. Like I, the way I say this to people is like, I don't even know if they're all actually scams, but it's just a useful way for me to frame it and move on and to stay laser focused on Bitcoin. Um, even to the extent something in crypto universe is not a scam, it still can't possibly hold a candle to separating money from state. So yep. even if it was fully an authentic project. Well, it can't, it can't be money, right? It, it can't, can't be, money. be money in an open market. It, it will lose to Bitcoin in the long run. And so it can't be money. And so then at best, you're talking about like incremental improvements to financial IT. Once you strip out the token, maybe there's some kind of like, consortia model or collaboration of some sort or the rails are interesting or something like that but you know none of these things will have monies associated with them in the future 100 percent. and i to put numbers like very conservative numbers to this we'd say the bitcoin opportunity is at least a hundred trillion dollar market probably more mm -hmm. yeah if the, to put that side by side if every crypto asset in the universe succeeded beyond all their founders wildest imaginations of so 30 whatever 30,000 shit coins succeed in their stated use case or value prop i still don't even think that would be in the tens of trillions of dollars so that's if 30,000 of these projects succeeded they might create again not that i think they would but they could not even create more than say 10 trillion dollars in value with well, a bitcoin opportunity alone is 10x that yeah so. and then you think about like what the importance is because the unlock of Bitcoin is this era that we think will come of increased human freedom and progress, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it increases GDP across yeah. all countries and all industries and, you know, the flourishing that comes with that. So, you know, one way to look at it is like, what's the market cap of these things? But the other way to look at it is what's the importance and what's the overall impact of it? Mm -hmm. And I would say that it's probably impossible for all of altcoins to be within three orders of magnitude the importance of bitcoin i think bitcoin is at least a thousand times more important than all altcoins put together yeah there's a moral and ethical imperative related to bitcoin that i just don't see anywhere else there's no other project that's addressing anything of that caliber so far as i can no tell. no no i mean the only place you can find it is really like you know providing the world with with energy and food and you know maybe saving lives in in the fields of medicine and biotech but the, yeah. those are the other only other things you can get this passionate about yeah yeah and the, yeah everything else that seems to have that that moral or ethical imperative seems to be related to bitcoin right like privacy technologies yeah. and, and yeah support, so yeah i mean this this kind of gets at you know what Bitcoin is, it's not, it's not following the adoption curve 
nor should it of something like an iPad or social media or something like that. It's much, much bigger. You know, this is, this is the framework from Carlotta Perez book written about 20 years ago, actually, um, technological revolutions and financial capital, um, you know, where a big technological revolution doesn't happen in one industry. It happens in all industries and Bitcoin is going to change all industries and all societies and all cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's one of the biggest things, you know, it's like the industrial revolution, um, you know, and then the one after that was probably mass production. So it'd be, you know, the symbol of that is, you know, the first model T rolling off the line. And then after that was the information revolution and Bitcoin is either the continuation of the, inv the information revolution, which probably started <laughs> interestingly in 1971 in the book, she calls that the start because it's the mm -hmm. first Intel chip that rolls off the fab. Um, kind of fascinating. Uh, I think it's so big that it's actually the start of its own. And, you know, historically, these things take from 30 to 80 years before the next one rolls around. And so I think that, you know, 1971 through to, you know, call it 2009 when network launches, I think that's the beginning of this new uh, sort of discovery phase. And there's an installation phase and a maturity phase and a saturation phase that takes a long ass time. Yeah. And Bitcoin could take the rest of the century. Yeah, well, uh, but it could also take till 2040. Depends on how fast this thing goes and how fast we push it. Yeah, there's the push on our side, which is the education, what you guys are doing at Swan, you know, getting Bitcoin into people's hands. Like that, that is such an important approach because ultimately yep. it's incentives that change outcomes, right? So when people hold Bitcoin, they tend to be uh, a little bit more favorable, favorably disposed to its success, let's say. Yep. Um, now you, okay. You've made quite the name for yourself. Calling out a lot of the bullshit. Especially uh, calling out Celsius recently before that breakdown, along with Terra Luna. We went through all of that pretty in depth in our prior conversations. Mm -hmm. What has happened in crypto land since we last talked yeah so i think the biggest thing was just the absolute sort of full-on exposure of the cfi lenders business model so this is these on ramps that cropped up that said like you know i'll give you yield on your coins and tried to set up sort of non-regulated banks essentially so this was celsius nexo uh, crypto.com, you know, uh, there's a few smaller ones, a bunch of them went under, uh, block I'd put in that category as well. Um, and the sort of the, I wouldn't say dominant narrative, but probably like a plurality of the stories about this have been about Sam Bankman fried and FTX slash Alameda research. So FTX being the altcoin casino exchange um, that competes with Coinbase and Binance, and then Alameda Research being the original firm, which is a prop trading firm and a market maker, you know, just think about them like, uh, you know, SAC for crypto or something like that. So they're like jump capital, um, Genesis kind of firms like this that you hear about Galaxy's trading desk. So uh, Alameda is one of those. And, you know, he has gotten a ton of media coverage a lot of puff pieces a few tougher ones but not very many of them accurately breaking apart kind of what's actually going on and what the incentives are and kind of so there was this whole narrative that went out after these these cfi lenders started to collapse where uh sbf sam bankman fried was backstopping them and lending them money and sort of like making sure that they wouldn't go under. And so there was this, you know, is Sam Bankman fried you know, crypto's savior? First of all, I mean, crypto is not really worth saving, but nevertheless, the, the narrative itself is false anyway, because him putting up like a billion dollars to prop up these partners that owe his firms way more money. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it's positive ROI to his own net worth. He owns a ton of these firms that are worth, you know, $30 billion or something at their last fundraising round for FTX. And, you know, those things go under along with all of the money that FTX had loaned them. And, you know, his own personal net worth goes down by 10, 15 billion. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So obviously it's, you know, spend a penny, save a pound. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was nothing sort of altruistic or savior like about that at all. And that narrative was kind of bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this whole narrative about like him, you know, having altruistic goals or this myth of, you know, the, the values that his parents instilled in him, obviously bullshit. The dude's mercenary he worked for, you know, hedge funds in New York and, you know, has done nothing but trading, doesn't understand Bitcoin, which is the best thing that we have going on for humanity today. Basically, it's kind of the way out for most things that that cause us ill. And he doesn't care about it, doesn't know about it and actively works against it by promoting all this bullshit like Solana and, you know, whatever else, serum and all this crap that they kind of uh, get behind and, and pump and dump. So, you know, I think there's I think there's a lot of dirt there. Um, I think journalists are starting to dig in and they're kind of like sick of just listening to their PR firms, puff pieces. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, so I think it'll be kind of interesting. Um, you know, I think things, things are starting to come to light. Like, you know, they have their own shit coin on the exchange FTT, which is the exact same thing as has the same function as Celsius or CRO coin for crypto.com or whatever Nexos coin is. It's just this thing that they made up that they control and own most of that they manipulate like crazy because if the price drops a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, they can just, it's very illiquid mm-hmm. and it's also staked. So you can't even sell the thing for 10 days. It's constantly like a rolling staking thing or something my understanding um so they can really manipulate the hell out of it and kind of keep keep a floor on it and this is their token pile of this thing that they created and and gave to themselves is over half of their uh net equity so it's like it's like almost four billion of the six and a half billion of net equity uh you know book value or whatever that uh that ftx has and so it's a confidence game it really is a confidence game. Like, do you believe that this shit coin that they created for themselves and granted to themselves and that they manipulate the price of every single day is worth all of that because they use it as collateral for the loans that they take out for their trading operations for, you know, and for a billion, a million other reasons. And so the question is like, should investors continue to fund this thing when it's appears to be a similar structure as these other house of cards businesses that have fallen Mm. don't know we'll see i don't know enough about it but it just i think as usual when there's a narrative about somebody who's doing something bad like i think objectively shitty which is you know try to promote altcoin trading in a casino for retail investors where they go get their faces ripped off by his trading firm that has black boxes and algos and PhDs everywhere. Like it's, and and this is their sandbox where they rip everybody's faces off Mm -hmm. and none of these things can be bought and held for the long term. We did that research over the summer. So you can go on the Swan website and look up, uh, you know, the one hit wonders, Uh, Sam Callahan, our our lead analyst for Swan Private. And I, we ran the numbers, man, 22,000 altcoins, only three have ever had a new all-time high in Bitcoin terms three or more years after their first all-time high. You had Ripple had a pump in 2017 that was higher than they did in 2013. You had Dogecoin get pumped by Elon in 2021 that was higher than 2017. And the third one is BNB, which didn't have a full sort of spike in 2017 because it came out in 2017. Mm -hmm. And so it was higher in 2021. So like two and a half coins out of 22,000, every single other one has bled out since it reached its pump, its pump, its initial pump, it has dumped versus Bitcoin. And the three that I mentioned are all down 50 to 90% in Bitcoin terms since then, and we'll never reach those highs ever again. Yeah, wow. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of 
of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through crowd health. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download this state-of-the-art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Swan Private is a concierge financial services firm based in Los Angeles. Now, I've known the Swan team for years, and these guys are laser focused on the Bitcoin mission. They even have a zero tolerance policy for all shitcoining. Recently, their CEO, Corey Clipston, was instrumental in calling out many of these crypto scams right before they collapsed, saving a lot of people a lot of money in the process. Swan Private focuses on guiding high net worth individuals and businesses on all aspects of Bitcoin strategy, including buying, custodying, and market research. This concierge service provides you direct access to a private advisor by text, phone, or email. So go to swanprivate.com slash breedlove today to sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This is going to be a three-day event held May 18th through 20th, 2023 in Miami, Florida. This is going to be the biggest Bitcoin event of the year, and the past two years in Miami have been simply amazing. Speakers already announced for 2023 include Michael Saylor, Alex Gladstein, Corey Clipston, and many others. Last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway specifically for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So, to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Masterworks. Masterworks gives you access to the fine art market at more affordable price points. They do this by offering you fractional shares in their $500 million portfolio of fine art. Now, fine art is an alternative asset class and historically it's been a great performer and a really good hedge against inflation most investors typically hold anywhere from two to ten percent of their assets in an asset like fine art to sign up or learn more go to masterworks.com and use promo code breedlove now i'd like to tell you about our sponsor casa casa makes it simple to buy and secure your bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. The, it sounds to me like the, the Sam Bankman Freed thing, he's almost acting like lender of last resort for some of these companies. Yeah, he, he's, he's trying, they're trying to pump like a JP Morgan, you know, narrative for him, basically. Hmm. But a benevolent one. But what he's really doing is he's trying to buy off legislators and he's trying to get crypto out of the purview of the SEC and push it over to the CFTC. And the whispers in the background is we will make you guys super powerful and give you millions and millions and millions of dollars for budget. You can absolutely pillage in fees and membership fees and whatever, all of these crypto casinos and crypto trading firms, as long as you, the CFTC, will regulate us and not this, not the SEC. The last thing that they want is for the SEC to apply the laws on the books to the shit that they trade on their casinos. So they're trying Because to obviously they are, they are securities under the laws that we have under the books. Right. So they're trying to change the laws and basically perform a, a miracle of regulatory capture 
faster than anything like that has probably been done before. So, well, wow. so that's kind of the game afoot. They are, I guess, trying to circumvent or even modify securities law to some extent to get these shitcoin projects uh, cleared, cleared, cleared to continue. Yeah, wow. yeah exactly. Um, and then it's so funny because he's acting like Linder Last Resort. They also put out their own shitcoin. Like it sounds very much like a central bank operation in a way. Um, yeah. How long can this keep going on? Though, like, I, I didn't think we would see another shitcoin season after 2017, but sure enough, we saw another one. And, and so, in in retrospect, I think the the faster we're debasing a currency, the more we're actually creating this demand for gambling devices. Mm -hmm. That's where shitcoins really shine. I think they basically are just gambling devices. So yeah. there's some of that wind at the back of the sales of the shitcoin market but there's also this wind in front of it that is people keep getting annihilated and there's the threat of of regulation coming down on them how, how do you see this point you think we're gonna have another one of these things in a few years and another regulatory response or i don't know how do you see this playing out i mean i think the only i think people actually understanding bitcoin and how different it is is probably the best vector of attack against the crypto scam. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really just just winning winning that battle and sucking the liquidity and the attention back over where it belongs. I think is probably the the best thing that can happen. You know, I mean, these things don't stand a chance over the long run in free market competition with Bitcoin anyway. So that happens to be true. Um, you know, so I'm not, I guess where I get a little tripped up because Bitcoiners will say, oh, there should be no regulation. The SEC shouldn't even exist, bro. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, that's true, but I don't see any of these folks having been in DC, like banging the table for the last 10 years, trying to remove regulations from penny stocks, from Ponzi schemes. You know, I don't say them see them saying like, hey, you know, Jordan Belfort should be able to send direct mail to my grandma's nursing home. Like, why are you getting in the way of this financial innovation? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so it seems very selective. And it seems basically because these Bitcoiners have friends in crypto or some kind of tie up or their VCs or crypto VCs or whatever it is. And it seems like there's always some kind of other thing going on there when they go to bat for the shit coins when it comes to regulation, you just, you can't have it both ways. Like you can't have a coin base that benefits from capital markets that are regulated and then say, but here with my other hand, I don't want regulations for the, you know, I want all the securities and the compliance and the trust and the brand of being on the NASDAQ and having global investors trust that, you know, my stock and my security is vetted, but I want to be able to do whatever the fuck I want with these these dog shit shit coins and like universal pet income and you know everything that Balaji concocted in his year of ruining Coinbase. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't. So then there's the the crackdown of the SEC on these unregistered securities, but then there's the pushback from the crypto industry that's using these windfall gains they're acquiring from yep. retail to try to push regulation back or yeah. otherwise confound So it. this is, this is, so everything that's working for Bitcoin is making us run faster and making us win the adoption race. Mm -hmm. And everything that is going contra Bitcoin, like, ripple funded greenpeace studies and and Drayson Horowitz fun, you know hiring regulators as gps so that they can lobby full time without having to like adhere to lobbyist requirements you know all of those things are working contra bitcoin and making us go slower on the adoption race mm -hmm. and you know i know we're going to get into this and we should probably just start now but like it's more important than most people think it's more important than most bitcoiners think it's way more important than folks working in crypto realize because the only thing that could significantly delay the adoption of Bitcoin and the ushering in of this bright orange future with increased pro prosperity and human freedom 
is a concerted effort by the United States government at the fore, obviously leveraging banks and five eyes and you know everything around the world, the apparatus that is that is supported by the the treasury and dollar based monetary system or tied in with that system um, to move contra Bitcoin and contra Bitcoiners. You can't beat Bitcoin in the long run, but you can delay it by a century. Mm -hmm. We could just win this thing and just like be high-fiving in 2035 or 2040. And it could be, you know, full-on store of value, 100 trillion market cap, you know, widely used medium of exchange, dual unit of account next to the dollar and a couple other currencies by 2035. That can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also be that we enter a dark period where everybody has to go NIM and all of the, you know, KYC Bitcoin ends up with boots on necks and, you know, it just gets like really gross and scary. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoinization doesn't happen until sometime in the middle of the next century. Mm -hmm. That could happen. Um, and so I think it's a lot more important than people realize. And it's not just something you can toss your hands up and just be like, oh, let the market decide. No, be an active participant, make it happen. Yeah. And you're actually working. I mean, I'm not going to, I laugh about this because like, you can't be like, stopping a basketball game because you're you know a guy on your team you know happens to work for a crypto fund and and say dude you're an enemy of human freedom like mm -hmm. you can't do that right because they don't understand this right. framework and they don't believe it right they don't believe it yet um but when you break it down and you get to brass tacks like that's what's happening like this is this is a race to win bitcoin adoption so that we don't have to fight a war mm. you know it's a race versus elements that could coalesce and game theoretically will coalesce between the government the banks and altcoins and will come together working contra bitcoin and you can see it kind of growing and the question is like how big will it get how powerful will it be and and how fast will they run and can we run faster and get to the point where we actually flip the whole society, the society that matters being the United States, and get to the point where where it's impossible to unseat Bitcoin and it's impossible to make life difficult for Bitcoiners because we're already too strong. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to me that, um, I mean, this is core to the mission. This is why you start the company, basically, right? Yes, this is the mission. Yeah. yeah. The mission statement that I wrote in February of 2020, a month before we launched was 10 million Bitcoiners, which was specifically about 10 million Bitcoiners in the United States, not 10 million Swan customers. Don't mm -hmm. give a shit about that. Doesn't matter. It's a monetary protocol. Mm -hmm. um, but this was always about that intransigent minority of three to 4% of the population in the United States being hardcore Bitcoiners, which is what flips societies is mm -hmm. that intransigent minority that just won't bend. Yeah. And it, it's, I mean, I, I guess it does take a lot. Obviously we've done a lot of work in self-education to get to this level of understanding of money and Bitcoin. But once you get here, it seems somewhat obvious that, I mean, Bitcoin is like one of the most in the spirit of America, right? This enterprise that we've had towards decentralizing government and having uh, more human freedom and then creating the most wealth and prosperity that human beings have ever done as we've done in the West. Bitcoin seems to be an obvious extension of that. It's like, just mm -hmm. leave people alone. Basically that's the trick to human prosperity and Bitcoin gives the individual the power to be left alone uh, to a, yep. a very great degree. Um, how do we, it seems like there's, there's a good fitness there, right? Between the, the, the American enterprise, let's say, and I don't mean the nation, I mean, what we've, the experiment that is America, the mm -hmm. spirit of the U.S. Constitution, the spirit of the Bill of Rights. How do we attach Bitcoin to that narrative so that people, like, it feels like maybe, I don't want to politicize this at all, but, you know, libertarians or diehard right-wingers that are, that are constitutionalists, if they understood Bitcoin at all, they would immediately be all about it right it fits right into their worldview it just seems like there's some disconnect between uh, their understanding of of governmental and, and political reality and and what bitcoin is how do we close that gap yeah i mean it's it's a lot easier for the organizations that aren't um 
that don't have a bunch of kind of entrenched academics that make money from bitching. Right. So if you get like Students for Liberty and it's, you know, Wolf von Lehr, I'm maybe you've had him on, I'm not sure, but uh, you know, he's like young and hip and, you know, gets Bitcoin and, you know, like very easy to align his organization with Bitcoin and they talk about it all the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, you get something like Cato Institute where these guys are making like millions of dollars a year and they've got books and they've got all this shit. And it's like, if there's a solution to the problem, you're kind of out of a job. Like you just become mm -hmm. one of Satoshi's automatons like you and me, and like you're working in Bitcoin, right? Because every other solution pales in comparison and Bitcoin will solve most of these things and will create different problems. Like there are going to be disruptions and things to solve, right? When we, when we switch over to Bitcoin, but those all create economic opportunity and entrepreneurial opportunity. Um, there will be policy responses for things that that happen because of bitcoinization that'll be required and we'll see what see how things play out but you know so much of their work and they, they just they can't they can't see it because they don't want to see it because they're academics mm -hmm. even if they're in a think tank and and shit on academia all day yeah. they're actually academics too um, I think a good That's example cool. of like how hard it is to change like the this isn't just like a, a Bitcoin monetary type thing. It's like, it's in all fields, right? Like you, you can't, you can't, it's very hard to find a textbook that, uh, about anthropology and sort of like recent history last 10, 12,000 years, you know, since the, the, since the ice age that actually gets the order right of, of how we humans sort of past because for hundreds of years now last 150 200 years we've said oh we did our agriculture first and that what supported like a large population and then we could have you know large temple complexes because people were getting religious mm -hmm. and it was all pagan before that and then you know in 1994 they discovered gobekli tepe in anatolia which was a temple complex that clearly supported well over a million people and there wasn't agriculture yet and it's like oh fuck <laughs> but it's not in the textbooks and nobody talks about it or teaches it unless you find, you know, the quack on Rogan or something like that, but it's all real. And it's like, you can go visit the thing and it's there. And, uh, you know, it's 28 years on now. And have you heard of it before? I have. You have. Okay. But Ooh, yeah, I'd, I'd say a lot of people haven't. Quack on Rogan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, he's, so that one is real. I don't know about the Amazons thing, but yeah. you know, it's, it's obviously a popular site that people go visit in Turkey, but you know, it's just not making the textbooks in the West because it just kind of disrupts our, our myth of how things progressed uh, into, you know, Western culture over time. It reminds me of that. There's an example in this book, Leela that Percy talks about the case of the platypus where before the platypus, you know, we always thought mammals nursed their young on the teat and then reptiles laid eggs and uh you know ducks had flipper feet or whatever and then here we get we find this animal that has like all the things and a duck bill and it just it's a good reminder that we we draw these categories you know we put things in boxes categorical boxes but then nature things are always more complicated than our categories i guess is, the, is kind of the punchline yeah uh, absolutely so anyway, so bringing it back, like, and tying it together. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I think you read a draft of the race versus the war or the race to avoid the war, but this is kind of, you know, the thing I've been working on, I've been tweeting about this and talking about it on podcasts all year, finally put pen to paper last week and, and wrote it, but I'll put this out around the time of the conference and I'll probably talk about it at the conference and just kind of, you know, keep fleshing this out. But I think that is the way. It's probably the overarching, it's my best personal framework to see what's going on in Bitcoin and altcoins and banks and government and, you know, blockchain and crypto associations versus the Bitcoin Policy Institute and Sat Center and Open Sats and all these different things and the crypto VCs versus the Bitcoin VCs and like just kind of all the privacy tech. Because it's like one thing that's really important, I think, and this is why I have gotten very passionate about uh, Bitcoin privacy tech and non-KYC ways of buying Bitcoin because they're just so complementary. Mm -hmm. So when I look at something like Azteco, 
doing vouchers, which you can, you know, basically go and and just buy a voucher and and the merchant never actually has Bitcoin. The Bitcoin actually comes from Azteco. And it looks like it's very clear in a legal framework that you can go and buy these buy these vouchers, you know, in in decent size. Like you can buy up to a thousand dollars and you can you can buy a few vouchers, right? So it's this this way kind of around, this sly roundabout way to get Bitcoin non-KYC potentially. Um, at least in many jurisdictions, uh, without having to worry about about KYC, because um, you can just show up with piles of cash, right? Um, and then you think of like everything going on with like with paynims and privacy and and coin join join market wasabi whirlpool all that stuff, like all of those are making the opposition run slower. They're making it harder for the nexus of shit coins, governments and banks mm -hmm. and sort of the, the, the dollar supported fiat system to move in size contra Bitcoin. Mm. While we on my side with mass adoption and media and just trying to get everybody into Bitcoin. So they become Bitcoin soldiers and join us in the ranks of Satoshi's automatons, uh, which is, I don't know who said it first, but I heard it from Will, Fult, Will at Fold. And I, th I think it's hilarious because it's how I feel. I just feel like I'm just in servant of this mission. Um, I think it they that's what makes everybody completely on the same team because we're trying to win a race. We're trying to win a race by pushing Bitcoin faster and by making the other guys move slower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such such an important race we should probably unpack the intransigent minority a little bit because i know mm -hmm. you and i both got that from talab i would imagine yeah that's where i learned it at yeah. least uh and i somewhat obscure for most people so like what when you say you're trying to create 10 million bitcoiners in the u.s three to four percent of the population that's what yep. flips society yeah uh, can you just unpack that a little bit for how how does that actually work? Because it on the sure surface, yeah it doesn't. So work. the the example that Taleb gives uh, is halal meat in the UK, mm -hmm. and so basically once three percent of the population uh, wouldn't eat meat unless it was prepared halal, which mm -hmm. I think means like not leaving the blood in the in the meat basically before you cook it. Um, it's not important enough for the other 97% to like not buy the meat. They're not intransigent. Intransigence yeah. just means like, I'm just definitely not doing this shit. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the Muslims and the others that, that wanted to eat halal, they wouldn't eat the meat unless it was halal and would make a stink about it. And so you could either carry halal meat and non halal meat, but it's much easier just to make the food chain, the food supply for the most part halal. Uh, cause everybody else is pretty much fine with it. Right. Um, kosher foods, right. So you have kosher foods in the U S and you know, there's, I forget what the symbol is, but like on most of your, most of your packaged goods, there's a little kosher symbol on most of this shit. Mm. Right. And it's because it was demanded by an intransigent minority that wouldn't eat non-kosher and the rest of us that don't think about it, don't really care whether there's a K symbol or whatever the kosher symbol is. We don't care. We'll eat it anyway. Yeah. So they flipped it. Yeah, there's this. And so, yeah. Like an economic gain from almost standardizing to just halal meat, for instance, even yep. if only three or 4% really strongly prefer it, so long as the other 95% are sort are cool of cool with it. Yeah. And exactly. as long as the cost difference isn't super high, right? Like halal yep. or non halal was kind of an immaterial cost difference. Yep. And so, I've thought about that a lot as it applies to Bitcoin. I wrote about it early on too. And if, do you think it's people or measure, is it the three to four, three to four percent measurable in people or capital or a combination of both that flips it? Yeah, I think it has to be people mm. actually. And I know you and I have talked about this because obviously Bitcoin is a monetary protocol and you and others have affected my thinking on that. And I think I've been, you know, a, a driving force of us setting up uh, Swan Private first, and now the Swan Advisor Services, which, by the way, is taking off. We've we've had our first actual end client purchases over the last couple of weeks, so it works and it's awesome. So if you're a 
if you're a wealth manager, hit me up, swan.com slash advisor. Uh, we'll help you get Bitcoin into your client portfolios. Okay, in Shell. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think uh, I think it is both, but I think in terms of politically, and in the framework that I'm thinking of, of winning the race to avoid the war, I think that has to be people. Yeah. I think it has to be people because these are people that have to vote. They have to show up at town halls. They have to make things difficult for politicians that, that come out contra Bitcoin. You know, I think even, even what we did with Erica Rhodes against Brad Sherman was enough. I know he didn't talk about Bitcoin in his campaign. Mm -hmm. you know at all and this is this is a, a a democratic rep out here uh in the la area i think he reps like burbank and glendale and and some a lot of the san fernando valley um he might have calabasas too i'm not sure um because i don't live there anymore but um anyway he's been kind of like the the most vocal rep anti-bitcoin rep in congress for years now and, you know, we all literally just for the purpose, I know some people got involved in her campaign and like really got to know her and liked her ideas or whatever. It wasn't ever about that for me. It was just like, I wanted to back a candidate that would get into Bitcoin and become eloquent on it and make it a really difficult issue for Brad Sherman to talk about. Just wanted to punish him for it. <laughs> um, and she got pretty damn famous talking about Bitcoin for, uh, you know, six months there in the primary and made it very clear that this was an issue that would draw a lot of money and attention to your opponent. Yeah. Um, if you are speaking out against Bitcoin, I haven't heard a peep from Brad Sherman on Bitcoin since. That's a great little case study on that. Um, yeah, I, I originally thought it was going to be capital, right? Three to four percent of total addressable market that would that would cause Bitcoin to really hit that escape velocity. But that might that might be true in terms of price and market cap. It's very yeah. possible that it it might both happen. I, I just it's a combination of both. It has to be because if you just took a, a wild example, right? Like uh what could we say here? If it's a hundred trillion dollar market, you need three to four trillion dollar market cap for it to hit that escape velocity. You know, one nation state could you know, own that much Bitcoin in theory, I guess. And yeah, that wouldn't be here's enough. the way, here's the way I think about it. And maybe so this, this is actually, you know, from the last three and a half years of working on Swan and building it, uh, Bitcoin purchased is a, so number of users is a leading indicator. It comes before revenue, it mm -hmm. comes before sales. So that's, yeah. I think, probably, I mean, this. that's actually how our business is. And that's how we we try to get as many users as possible. And they buy Bitcoin later after they're educated. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. they buy a little bit. You teach them more. They buy more. The more you know, the more you buy. But I really do think, I mean, it makes sense, right? You need the people to be into Bitcoin before they buy a lot of it. And yeah. so I think I think it's just, I think the cause is people getting into Bitcoin and the effect is that they put a lot of value into Bitcoin. Yeah. And then you get that flywheel word of mouth effect, right? Once people are in Bitcoin, they've learned about it. They yeah. tend to not be able to shut the fuck up about it. <laughs> like Sometimes a, they even ditch their careers and just decide to talk to people about <laughs> Bitcoin every day, all day. Yeah. Yeah. Weirdos. I don't know why they do that. Psychopaths uh, actually. <laughs> So, all right. Yeah. I like, I don't know, I guess I am seeing more and more the importance of the Swan mission, especially as things have gotten weirder the past two years. Um, and it does seem to be especially relevant in the United States where we kind of leverage the already somewhat decentralized political infrastructure, uh, like yeah. a study you just gave about, about Brad Sherman and, just helping to spread this idea right into people that have influence yeah. and sway within within government uh, it makes a lot of sense so yeah but again this is where the battle like this is where it actually needs to be won but every country that flips and gets orange pilled everywhere that bitcoiners can go and flourish and make it difficult for bitcoin to be attacked mm -hmm. right 
is making the opposition run slower, making yeah. it less likely that this, you know, axis of evil of governments, banks, and altcoins <laughs> collectively move in a big way contra Bitcoin. Yeah. So, you know, everything that Bitnob is doing, everything that Relay is doing, everything that HODL HODL is doing, like everything that these companies and everything going on in Bitcoin Beach and everything going on in Jamaica with, uh, with uh, Pole Vault Dream, like all of these things working in concert, yeah. uh, slow down the opposition, make Bitcoin less attractive to attack make Bitcoiners look harder to unseat and attack. Yeah. Uh, so it all it all works together. It's all part of the race to avoid the war. Um, it's just so happens that, uh, you know, the only opponent that actually matters here is the U.S. government because it coordinates everything. Yeah, and it, well, the other interesting thing about that is the U.S. government is in such a privileged position to be able to adopt, well, first of all, as we said earlier, it's consistent with the spirit. Bitcoin of for America. Yeah. Yep. But then we already have the global reserve currency. We can export all this inflation. So if we started to adopt Bitcoin, I mean, we could, the United States could single-handedly drive hyper-Bitcoinization. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So how, I mean, yeah. I, Unilaterally. Cool. Yeah. You flip the system, you know. So us being constituents of the United States, like and Bitcoiners, it is absolutely incumbent upon us to fight this battle to avoid the here. war at the grassroots. Here, yes, it has to be here. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not. I'm not even leaving SoCal, Socialist Republic of California. Like I'm fighting it here. Uh, you're a better man than I. I had to get out of SoCal. Back to the. Sorry, you you can come visit sometimes. South. That's all right. But I, you know, I was born here. You were born in Tennessee, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, okay. So you're going to publish this piece before the conference you said, right? Either just before or just after. Yeah. Uh, I haven't decided yet. Um, yeah. Soon. This is a really Feedback. Good welcome. You have a draft. So <laughs> <laughs> this is a really good framing, I think, especially for, hopefully alleviating some of the confusion related to shit coins and that it is just a uh it is a ball and chain on the success of bitcoin yeah and i think to put those in the same category as central banks and and government you know centralized governments let's say makes a lot of sense um and yeah we need to do the thing right here in america yes we do um okay well i am going to shill stack chain now because stack chain is awesome and we haven't gotten you on the stack chain um but we will i'm i'm now officially a stack chain legend because i have the t-shirt but uh sure yeah if you're if, if you're on bitcoin twitter check it out just do hashtag stack chain and click latest and find out about it but we got sailor on there it's actually really simple. It's basically somebody bought $5 worth of Bitcoin and posted a screenshot of their buy. And then uh -huh. somebody thought that was funny. And so they replied with a $6 purchase and then seven, eight, nine, whatever. Anyway, we're in like 2,200 or something now. It's been almost $2 million of Bitcoin purchased in the stack chain. And it's the canonical chain goes all the way back and the replies all the way back to the, uh, to the very beginning. Um, but yeah, it's kind of gamified stacking. It's, it's just a really fun, it's like a meme driven community basically. Uh, and I'm a fan. We're doing a lightning hackathon on Wednesday, the ninth, the day before the conference with voltage and, and, um, TVP Trammel and Cal Calicott's venture firm, but we're also in the same venue doing a stack chain hackathon. Um, so I just wanted to give a shout out to, uh, both the lightning community and the stack chain community and, uh, really excited for that hackathon day as well on the ninth. The end game of that is just how big these dollar buys of Bitcoin can become until it's. Yeah. Yeah. So they obviously like some people wanted to stack and they didn't happen to have like two grand sitting around. So they created stack joins. And so there's a whole, a whole way to like contribute, you know, a hundred bucks or six bucks mm -hmm. or whatever to join a block. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's music, there's songs, there's. Because I mean, Bitcoiners have other talents. There's music producers and rappers and DJs and artists, and there's videos and all kinds of shit. It's it's interesting to me. You know, I, I try to find these things early, as you know, and and spot things that have energy and like and contribute and get behind them. And 
this is probably the first sort of mass market in Bitcoin movement that's decentralized that you can do something other than just be a Bitcoiner while you're in Bitcoin. Mm. That's kind of what I'm seeing here with Stack Chain. So it's it's something to watch. It's pretty fun. Uh, we're going to get you on the Stack Chain uh, this week, Rob. Yeah. All right. All right. You showed okay. me. You showed me at uh, Poolside down there. I did. I, I did the same oh. same day that Sailor stacked his block block yeah. twenty eighty the Sailor block. <laughs> um. So yes, we're gonna need a we're gonna need a breed love block here this week. All right. Well, I I got a couple of grand sitting around, so we can make that. Okay. Happen. Good. I just need to jump through the technical hurdles. <laughs> We'll do it uh, right when we sign off here. I'll help you, and we'll 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 find it together, and uh, and we'll stack a block. Awesome, stack chain. Then I'm gonna need one of those T-shirts that says I'm. Yeah, a you are. You are gonna need one of those. <laughs> awesome. I think we'll have them at the conference. Anyway, well, I'm looking forward um, to seeing you in a couple of weeks or a week and a half. Yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's two weeks from today is the first one, but I think you're coming in earlier in the week, hopefully, for some yeah. of the side stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just, I can't, I can't believe it's here. Can't wait for it. You know, I know I haven't been able to make it to many conferences the last couple of years because of family health issues. So, you know, I am going to Miami in the spring, um, going to be speaking there. So that's going to be fun. And I'll try to get to more of these, uh, over time, but, uh, yeah, this is my first big Bitcoin conference since, uh, San Francisco, 2019, which is crazy. That is crazy. Wow. And that, I'll never forget that conference because that's when Bitcoin was doing that crazy run out of nowhere. To like, well, it went it went to thirteen eight on the day of the conference that yeah. night when we were all out at bars. It went to thirteen eight that night. Crazy June twenty sixth of twenty nineteen. Yeah. <laughs> Bitcoin always does. Yeah. What you don't expect it to do. least expect it. Yeah. Hey, listen. We're over 20K again for the first time in like three weeks. So there's that. There you go. Well, <laughs> something, to be, something to be celebrated, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, well, let's get on some stack chain. I appreciate you coming on and talk yeah. to you soon. For Great to see four. you. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on, Rob.